Bible, please turn to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. To be a person of faith in the God of Scripture is mainly and most simply to be someone who believes that God keeps his promises. That's really all we're banking on, that God can and will keep his word. That's the only hope we have. When we say we're believers, we're saying what we believe is that what God has promised to do through his son, Jesus Christ, he is going to do. The Bible reveals God to be a God of promise. Again, he speaks his promises into existence, and then he speaks them into fulfillment. During Advent, we remember and celebrate the fact that God keeps his promises because all of his promises find their yes, they find their amen in the son he sent, which is, of course, what we celebrate at Christmas time. Hopefully, as we grow in the faith, we're growing by the means of hearing these promises over and over and over again. The word of God is powerful. It creates life. It causes things to grow, and in his word is his promise do you remember some of the songs we used to sing in Sunday school or junior church? Maybe you have recently if you're little. Father Abraham, you remember that song? Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham, and I'm one of them, and so were you. So let's just praise the Lord. And then somebody threw in right arm, left arm, right foot, left foot, like it's the hokey pokey. I don't know what it is, but have you ever thought about how biblical, though, that little song is, how much truth is loaded into it. If only everything we were taught in Sunday school was that theologically sound, that biblically deep. Father Abraham, we can sing that. We are, as believers, literal and legitimate sons of Abraham. How is that possible? How can we as New Testament Christians possibly say that we are sons of Abraham? Well, that's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. That's what the whole story is. One thing held Abraham together throughout his long life. One thing was his constant. Pete Lang says that Abraham knew that his God was a God who kept his promises. All our hope, all of it, comes from knowing one thing, that God will keep all the promises he makes to us. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your word. God, your promise. We praise you, Lord. I ask that for your name, for your glory in the hearts of your people, for their faith and for their joy, would you make your son Jesus Christ known through this sermon? Please help me speak the truth. Help me speak clearly or not speak at all. And please help everyone to hear, to believe in order that we might understand. And I ask these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me read the first eight verses here of Genesis 22. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. At the end of Deuteronomy, or at the end of Deuteronomy in chapter 26, verse 5, Moses described Abraham by saying he was a, a wandering Aramean, was your father. Abraham was certainly that. He was a wanderer. He had no home. No city in this world. He traveled 
all the way from the land of Ur to Haran to Canaan to Egypt, back to Canaan again. His life was filled with twists and turns, setbacks, surprises, joy, sorrow, all of these things, things like you and I go through in the land of our sojourn. But there was probably no bigger surprise in his life than the one that came when he was almost 100 years old. God told him that his wife, who was also no spring chicken, would bear him a son in her old age. His name would be Isaac. He would be the child of promise. But then came another surprise. We're reading it here. And this time it wasn't joyous news. God told Abraham to sacrifice his son, Isaac. How can the child of promise be sacrificed? Abraham certainly would have known that this child was God's child, right? That as his firstborn, uh, God had the right to his life. But why would God ask this? What could be the point? Why would Abraham have to ever go through this? Because Abraham also knew, we ask how could he go through it? Because he knew that this was a God who kept his promises. So one way or the other, God was going to keep it. That was enough for Abraham to endure, apparently, the impossible. We read later in Hebrews 11, 17 through 19, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promise was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named, right? So imagine Abraham's confusion when before Isaac has any of these offspring that were promised, the command comes to sacrifice him, to kill him. Isaac, being the child of promise, meant that through him, God would fulfill the promise of descendants. If Isaac dies before he bears children, how in the world can he be the child of promise? And the bigger question is for us, as we think through this story, how does one keep believing when God's actions seem to contradict God's promises. You trust him because he is the God of the impossible. In eleven nineteen 19 of Hebrews, he considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Abraham believed that God could raise the dead. That's how he made the impossibly difficult journey up this mountain with no lamb for the sacrifice except his own son. Not by strength of will did he do this, not by metal, but by faith that God was powerful enough to undo what was about to take place, to reverse it. All right, imagine the faith it takes for something like that. At some point, God must be trusted to do what is miraculous and supernatural and impossible, not just make lemons out or lemonade out of lemons. He does more than this, and we need to know him as the God who does more than this. If God's will is that Isaac die, it must also be that God's will is to raise him from the dead. That is how faith rationalizes things. Right? That's how faith rationalizes. The word of God cannot be undone. This God keeps his promises. I know this, so he will make a way. Father, yes, Isaac, there's fire and wood here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. Abraham doesn't know at that point what's going to happen. What he's saying is one way or another, a lamb will be offered up today. Imagine saying those words to your son, knowing they might mean that Isaac is that lamb. But what Abraham said is exactly what happened. Pick it up in verse 9. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. 
the angel of the Lord, whom I believe scripture reveals is none other than the pre-incarnate Christ, intervenes just in time, at literally the last second, to stay Abraham's hand and provide a ram for the sacrifice. Abraham calls this place Yahweh the Lord will provide. We know it as Mount Moriah, the mountain on which the temple would eventually be built in Jerusalem. But why this test? What's the point of it? To mess with Abraham or does God need to find out something he doesn't already know? That's not a very comforting thought and that doesn't seem to jive with the rest of scripture. So that's not it. Why? Because God wanted to show Abraham precisely what is required for his promise to be kept. Sacrifice. Sinners will not be saved without blood. God's promise will not be kept without blood. But God also wanted to make it clear to the universe that what was required, only he can provide by becoming the sacrifice. And I don't think what we read here is a simple matter of semantics. I think it's intentional. Technically speaking, technically speaking, a ram is not a lamb. That's not just a little switch in words that we just brush over. This was a sacrifice. It was not the sacrifice that would accomplish God's plan and promise. That would require a lamb and a spotless one, and one that wasn't made of wool, but made of flesh. Mount Moriah is also the place where Jesus Christ would come to die as the Lamb of God for the sins of the world. The Lord will provide indeed. The one who stayed Abraham's hand was the one who would one day be laid down on an altar shaped like a cross which means there would be no one to stay the hand that slayed him. You realize that. The only one that stands between justice and salvation was preoccupied at Calvary. There the father of all creation would not withhold, would not spare his son. This was the sacrifice that guaranteed the fulfillment of all God's promises, the greatest of which, of course, are made to believing Abraham. Pick it up in verse 15. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son. I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Back in Genesis 12, when he first called Abraham, God promised him that he would bless him in order to make him a blessing to all peoples. After Abraham passes the test of faith, the test to see if he, which again, what is that? If he truly believed that God would keep his promises, God again reiterates it, restates it, promises to him to bless him and his descendants, declaring that through Abraham's offspring, the seed of Isaac, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Remember the words of Psalm 2 from God the Father to his son on Mount Zion. Jesus, our Lord, the royal king, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Beloved, remember what the obedience of Jesus accomplished in his hour of testing. The son of David, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the blessing of God's great salvation to every nation, for it is those of faith who are the children of Abraham. Galatians 3, 7. Who are these descendants, these many sons that Abraham had? What is their DNA? Faith. Faith that God is a God who keeps his promises. Jesus Christ died, took on the curse of sin and death so that very specifically in him, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So beloved, remember who it is 
that lay in the manger. All the promises God had ever made were resting on the baby in a manger. How powerful must he be to keep his promises? Beloved, the same power that oversaw a baby to adulthood through all of his life to the cross on the appointed day at the appointed time for the appointed sacrifice necessary to redeem those he meant to save is overseeing every moment of your life and mine today. Beloved, that's what God does. He makes a promise to you and then he oversees it until it is accomplished. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is also the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Romans 8, 32. Isaac's blood would never be spilled for the sins of the world. Only God would give away his precious child. Only God would do this. God spared Abraham's son, just like he spares us what we deserve. He spares all the ones that should die and then does not spare his own son who should not die. Instead of sparing, he sends his son down from heaven to earth on a rescue mission to save the many sons of Father Abraham. He was born in Bethlehem, came up out of Egypt, grew up in Nazareth, baptized by John in the Jordan River, tempted by the devil in the wilderness. But where the first Adam failed to stand up to the snake, the second succeeded, and in so doing became the last Adam. And during his three years of ministry, he blessed Children taught the crowds, healed the sick, raised the dead. The pure and obedient son who perfectly imaged God, his father, as a human being became our substitute and therefore our salvation. And this he is and ever will be for all who, like Abraham, simply believe that God will do what he promises. That's what we believe. That's what makes a Christian a Christian. Not what they do. The story of Isaac and Abraham would read differently if the point of the story was what we do. The point of the story is always what God is doing. God intervenes where a sacrifice is required. He intervenes to provide it. Jesus Christ himself is the sacrificial lamb who dies to take away the sins of all the world. In him, all the nations of the world are blessed in him as adopted sons of Abraham, grafted into that vine, we are blessed. When the time of testing finally came for Jesus, that son of Abraham obediently picked up the wood and marched up the hill. Also, only this time, there was no bramble bush to take his place for the sacrifice. He was the sacrifice. God finally provided the lamb. And this lamb would do something Isaac could not have done if every last drop of his blood poured out on Mount Moriah. Take away the sins of the world. In him, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. In him, as adopted sons of Abraham, again, beloved, we are blessed. There's an assault on this idea. Did you know that in Christendom today? Has been for many years now. That what God did through Jesus Christ, that the, the technical term for it, the fancy theological term for it is penal substitutionary atonement. And in many theological circles today, they call it divine child abuse. Why would God ever do such a cruel thing, they say? It's abuse if he punishes Jesus for other people's sins. It's so unjust. You see how false doctrine always sounds like the devil is talking? Always. It just rationalizes, but not by faith, by reason. Right? It, it's not abuse. It's pardon. There's a difference. Abuse would have been the death of Isaac. That would have been abuse. That would have been abuse. And since Isaac's blood cannot give eternal life, that's why it would have been abuse. What would have been the point of it? 
That would have been the ritual of pagans, right? Bleeding out what could never satisfy or achieve salvation just to prove commitment from our side, right? When human beings create their religions or when they did before pagan places, this ran through all of them. Isn't that interesting? Whether you were in Asia or Norway, right? It was in, its, in, in essence the same thing. To show devotion to the God you worship, you were going to have to bleed and or die. Everything, see, Satan is a murderer. That's what he does. He causes people to get killed by way of false doctrine. That's what he does. He's always done it. He's been a liar and a murderer from the very beginning. The whole essence of what we as Christians are is wrapped up in this one thing. We don't die for our salvation. Jesus dies for our salvation. If you want to impugn a God like that with abuse, the driveway doesn't go all the way up to the house. This is not the truth. If the blood poured out gives life, do you see the difference? If the blood poured out gives life, if, if the punishing hand of God finally results in life rather than death, it's not abuse, it's salvation. It's God clearing the way for something. It's not God ending something. The cross is not the final word. Beloved, this father is not satisfied eventually over time, right? When his arm finally gets too tired from beating person after person after person until somebody finally gets it, right? It, it, the Bible really can be read if you really wanted to simplify it as failure, 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 failure. All right, I'll come down and do it myself. God doesn't stand over us with a whip demanding that we straighten up and fly right. Instead, a lamb that has been slain is standing over us. His arms stretched out, palms up to receive all who simply come to him for salvation. You see, that, that beloved, this is the issue that really has to end all the discussion. What has God ever done for me? Provided a lamb for your salvation. Father Abraham had many sons and many sons had Father Abraham. And I, even I, am one of them. And so are you. Are you? Are you one of the many sons? Is that your song too? then let's just praise the Lord. All our hope comes from knowing one thing, one thing that God will keep all the promises he makes to us. I, I think I've mentioned it before. There's a, there's a great song by a guy named John Mark McMillan called Counting On. It's just, and that, that's the essence of the song. He just says, you're, you're, you're what I'm counting on. You, this is Christianity. At the end of the day, I know that I am called to good works. I understand this and accept that. I don't deny that. I understand that because I have been born again, my life should reflect it. I understand and believe all of that. I'm saying I'm not counting on any of that to save me. And I don't want you to either. Don't count on it. Don't think that you're collecting a bag of goodies that you're going to hand to him on the last day as evidence that he should accept you. Right? In that line of thinking, it would have made sense to kill Isaac. Right? When we die, we don't stay in the ground. We get resurrected. Count on that. Just count on him. Right? All, all Christmas is really is proof all Christmas is, is the provision of the lamb God had always promised to be the sacrifice for us. The one whose blood meant something eternal when it was spilled. All the work has been done. All the payment has been made. Jesus has done all the heavy lifting. 
God is not a God like the others who can only be appeased by our blood. Isn't it interesting that when we want to show the highest devotion, we want to give up our lives and God won't accept it as salvation because our blood is cheap and we're worthless? No, because the only blood that can give eternal life has already been spilled. You don't get saved by spilling blood. You get saved by trusting in spilled blood. Not your own, not my own. God is a God unlike any other who gives his own blood, the blood of his son, for the salvation of those who believe in him. God does all the sacrificing. You and I do all the benefiting. Salvation is yours and mine for the taking. That's what I'm counting on. This is God's inexpressible gift to you and I. Take it. Take it. Why die for nothing? Take it. Live. Rest in it. It's finished. Merry Christmas. Let's pray. Father, we come to you for our salvation. We trust in you to accomplish all that you've willed for us and promised to us. Lord, I pray that you would be with us. Watch over your people in the week to come. Watch over those, Father, in our church that are going to be alone this week. I pray they not feel alone, Father. Please watch over them. Please help us not forget them, whether it's a call or a word or something, Father. Please let us not forget those that are going to have a particularly difficult time this Christmas, Father. Please watch over them. Watch over us as we go. Watch over us all with the same thing, your promise. Please let us remember it and call it to mind. And when we can't, call it to mind for us, Father. We ask you. We praise you. We thank you, God, for our church. We thank you for the truth. And we look to you for all things. And in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray these things. Amen. Amen.